three requests, please. First request is turn off your phones. Second request is this. Through the lecture, you'll have questions coming up from the lecture. I will not answer them because basically the answers will come along the lecture. So if you don't understand something, let it be. Uh, I'll get through the lecture. And the third thing is that at a certain point in the lecture, there is a very, very difficult segment. Very difficult, but it's totally important for the lecture. So I won't leave it out, but I'm already telling you in advance that I'll be telling you something that's very difficult. Okay. My name is Yaron Svore. I was born in Israel. My parents are Holocaust survivors. I lived in Israel as a, I had a normal upbringing. At the age of 18, I joined the army. Everyone in, this, uh, in Israel goes to army service. I ended up in what is known as your uh, equivalent to the Navy SEALs. And um, unfortunately, I saw a lot of action, uh, both in Lebanon, in Syria, and in Egypt, and other places. Uh, it was a difficult time, but I felt as though I'm doing the right thing. After years of service, I left the military and went to study political science and, and international affairs at the University of Jerusalem. After my first year of studies, I decided to uh, go down from Jerusalem, which was on, in the mountains, down to the city of Tel Aviv. And suddenly I meet another guy from my unit, and he's a captain, he's a high-ranking officer. At the time, he left the army, and he was given the task of turning some of the police force into the equivalent of your FBI. And he meets me and says, so what are you doing? I said, I'm a student. And he looked at me as though I've just cursed. And he says, listen, I am building... At the time, there was a TV show which is called Starsky and Hutch. I don't know if you remember it. Uh, the good-looking blonde guy, the short uh, guy with dark hair, there are, there are detectives, they run around, they've got cars, they've got girls, great fun. And he says, why don't you leave the university and come and join my new police force? And like an idiot, I stopped my studies and I became a, a member of this police force. I became a policeman, and then a detective, and I specialized in anti-terrorism activities. After a while in the police, one day I met a lovely woman who told me in no uncertain terms it's either her or the police. And I looked at her and I realized she's much better looking, so I left the police and uh, married this lovely woman. Then I got a scholarship to one of your finer universities in uh, New York. And we traveled to America, and I began my studies. And as a young student with a scholarship, things were OK. I could just study. Then I had my first son. And at that point, I realized that uh, the scholarship is not enough, and I have to work. So I studied and worked. And what I did was travel around the country, lecture to various organizations. I lect lectured about Israel, about the political situation about how Israel was born, about the Holocaust, etc. Usually at the end of the lecture, a group of people came and said, thank you for coming, and we appreciate it, and it's very nice of you. In the city of Bangor, Maine, at the end of a lecture, an, an elderly gentleman, I think in his mid-70s, uh, is waiting there with the crowd shaking hands. And uh, as I walk to him and say, thank you for coming, I put up my hand, and he grabs my hand in both his hands and says, thank you for coming. And then he says, would you like to hear a story about World War II? And I get a headache, and I'm saying to myself, an old Jew telling me a story about World War II, I'm, it's never going to end. So I say to him, thank you for coming, but I've got to fly out tomorrow to, to New York, and I appreciate it, but I won't have time. So he throws his hands in the air and says, well... If you don't want to hear a story about 40 diamonds buried on the French-German border after World War II, you don't have to stay. I said, no, 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 let's stay. <laughs> we sat down at the table and we began talking. We began talking at 9 o'clock in the evening. We finished talking at 7 o'clock in the morning. It was an incredible story. And basically it was him telling me World War stories. I'll tell you a bit of a story. The guy's name is Sam Nair. Sam Nair is a Jewish young man living in Brooklyn. And he's tall, 
and he's wearing very thick glasses. He is half, uh, not half blind, but he doesn't see well. And stories about what's happening in Europe begin trickling down to America, and they hear about the Jews and, and about the camps, but there's not much he can do. The Americans are not at war. Then, on the day of Pearl Harbor, as the Japanese attack America, America's in the war, and one of the first volunteers into the American army is our friend Sam Nair. And obviously the military sees that he's tall and gangly and he's wearing glasses, and they decide to put him as a very obvious choice. They make him a scout. Sam is a great scout. The moment the Americans land on the beaches of Normandy, Sam does what scouts do. By the way, the life expectancy of an American scout during the war is seven days. Why? Because they move about two miles ahead of the fighting units, and their job is to look around and come back with information about what's happening behind the hill. If it's, it's a tank unit or an SS unit or a Wehrmacht unit, they bring him back to the offices and they get ready to, bat to do battle the next day. Sam travels almost miraculously. He moves between the fighting and between the Germans and people are killed next to him and people are shot next to him. Nothing happens to him. As the American army arrive at the city of Strasbourg, which is the French city next to the Rhine River between France and Germany, suddenly and he's alone, he's moving ahead of the troops, suddenly German snipers start shooting at him. And he doesn't know what to do. He sees a big door to his right, and he runs to the door, tries to open it. The bullets are going next to him. He tries to open it with his shoulder, can't do it. He kicks the door, can't do it, takes his rifle, shoots at the door, and opens the door. As he looks around, he realizes that he's inside a bank. And not only is he inside a bank, at the moment, three German soldiers are robbing the bank. They, they are opening the safe deposit boxes. To his great luck, they put their weapons on the floor because they were busy with the safe deposit boxes. Sam sees the three German soldiers. He shoots them and throws a grenade and kills them. Then he walks over to the German soldiers, and he sees that one of them is holding in his hand. He's clutching in his dead hand. He's, he's clutching a bag. Remember once doctors had these bags that you close and open, a doctor's bag, rather large. And Sam pulls a bag out of the guy's hand and he realizes it's a heavy bag. And then he thinks, do I take it, do I not take it, do I take it? He decides to take the bag. Takes the bag, leaves the bank and joins the fighting in the streets of Strasbourg. At the end of the day, <coughs> Sam finds himself sitting at the edge of Strasbourg with the guys from his unit sitting there. He opens the bag, and it's full of loot, of stolen stuff. And the guys in the unit walk over, or a guy puts his hand in there and pulls out gold coins, puts it in his pocket, walks away. Another guy puts his hand in the bag, takes out watches, and so forth. Eventually, Sam is left alone. He puts his hand in the bag, and he pulls out a leather bag. And the leather bag, he pours its content into his hand, and he realizes it's full of diamonds, 40 large diamonds. No one's looking. He takes the bag and puts it in his backpack and says nothing. The American army fights for another 10 days, and they arrive at the Rhine River. And before crossing France into Germany, the command from General Patton is, we stop here. We don't go into Germany for the moment. Everyone digs a foxhole, and you wait in the foxhole. We're going to get more ammunition. We're going to get more officers, and then we attack Germany. Sam digs a foxhole. I do, if people who do not know what a fox hill is, a very deep hole, almost to your chest, and that's where you stay. And if they start shelling, you hide in the hole. Sam's hole is in the front of the, the, the forest on the hill, and he digs the, the hole, and then he waits. One day, two days, three days, and Sam begins to feel uncomfortable. Up to now, everything's been lucky, but he doesn't know what's going to happen next. So what he does is he decides to bury the diamonds in the foxhole, and he says to himself, well, if I die in the war, then I die in the war. But if I don't die, I'll come back to this foxhole and take the diamonds. And he figures, how will I find this foxhole? To the right of him, there is a farmhouse with a river running through it, and that's about a mile away. To his left, about 800 yards, there is a church with a small graveyard. And he says, okay, farmhouse, church, I'll create an imaginary triangle and be able to come back to my hole. Uh, you understand trigonometry. It's, it 
triangle. And he also looks at the, at the ground and he says, I'll, I'll remember where this is. The next day, the command from the generals appears and they say, attack, attack, attack. And the American army runs down the hill towards the Rhine River as Sam runs, suddenly feels his back as though a truck hit him. He falls to the ground, a small piece of shrapnel, a, poor, a small piece of metal hit him on the back behind his right shoulder. When this piece of metal comes out of his body, it tears his chest and his stomach is falling into the ground. He lies on the floor. He can't talk because there's blood in his mouth and he's going to die. A lot of soldiers go by him and they look at him and they say, well, it's a dead guy and they keep on moving. Suddenly, one of the men who knew Sam personally looks at Sam and Sam realizes he can't talk because his, uh, his throat is full of blood. What he does is he closes his eyes very quickly, opens them and shuts his eyes. The guy sees that Sam is alive. He gives him first aid. They take Sam to a, near, to a hospital about 20 miles away. Sam is between life and death for about six weeks. Then they manage to arrange it so he doesn't die. They send him to England, to a hospital in England, in Kent. Stays there for another half a year. The war was already over. And then he's sent back to America in a hospital ship, and he's in America convalescing for the next year. And there's one thing that bothers him all the time. The diamonds, the diamonds, the diamonds. He finishes his military service. He gets out of the hospital. And one day he meets a woman called Helen. She's Jewish, of course, and she's very devoted. And as soon as Sam starts telling about the diamonds, she says, I don't want to hear about it. I do not want to hear about it. These diamonds are cursed. I'm telling you that it was taken from Jews by the Nazis and these Jews were killed. I don't want to touch the diamonds. These are blood diamonds. I don't want to touch it. And Sam says, listen, we find it. We can be rich. I don't want to hear about it. And if you continue talking about it, we will get divorced. They are cursed. Listen, Helen, we'll be okay. Shh. If you continue talking about it, we're not going to get married. And Sam, like most men, shuts the hell up. <laughs> he begins a small business, has his first child. The business grows. Sam is his second child. By the time Sam is thick, is, has his third boy, his business is doing really well. When the boy gets to be 13, Sam takes the family to Jerusalem as a celebration of the boy's bar mitzvah, which is moving from childhood into manhood. They finish the celebration, and Sam says to his wife, I don't care what you say. I am going with the kid. We're going to get the diamonds. No, you're crazy. They're cursed. I don't care what you say. Sam goes with the kid to France. The wife goes back to Bangor, Maine with the entire family. She's very mad. Sam takes a car, rents a car, and they drive along the Rhine River. Suddenly, Sam stops and says to the kid, farmhouse, church, that's the hill. And he's very excited. They get out of the car. Sam pulls out a digging utensil, a shovel, and they start climbing up the hill towards where he believes his foxhole is and where the diamonds are. As they get to half the way up the hill, Sam looks down and says to his son, I'm feeling terrible. I'm feeling as though all the... Ghosts and the people that have been killed my, by me and, I, and were killed next to me, they're all here. And the son says, Dad, let's go away. I don't want to stay here. Sam says, absolutely not. We're going to get the diamonds. As they climb nearly to the top of the hill, Sam bends down and says, I'm feeling terrible. My chest hurts me. I can't breathe. And the son starts crying and says, Dad, I'm going alone. I'm not staying here. Sam says, absolutely not. We're going to climb the hill and find the diamonds. They get up the hill, Sam gets his second wind, looks around and says, farm, church, looks around and he says, that's my foxhole. They move out, this kid moves out and the foxhole by then, it's nearly 70 years, the, fo the foxhole is, is, uh, is full of dirt and, and mud, etc. Sam says to the son, move away, I'm going to start cleaning the hole. He takes the shovel, bends down on his knees hits the shovel once in the ground, gets a massive heart attack, lies on the ground, he's going to die. The son runs down, he sees a French farmer, they take him, uh, and Sam wakes up two and a half weeks after that heart attack. He wakes up, 
in the same hospital he lay during the war. But this time, as he wakes up, Helen is bending over him and she says, you're an idiot. These diamonds are going to kill you. I told you they are cursed. As Sam is telling me the story, I constantly think, what the hell? Just tell me where the diamonds are and I'm going to get them. About 7 o'clock in the morning, I asked Sam, Sam, why did you tell me the story? Sam looks at me and says, well, you seem like a kind do kind of a guy. And I said to Sam, okay, let's go and get the diamonds. He says, no, 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 I'm not going to get the diamonds. They nearly killed me twice. But I'll be happy to give you any information that I can regarding the diamonds. And I'll, I'll tell you the name of the city, and I'll tell you the day I was wounded. And we write down everything. I write it on a napkin, no GPS, no map, no nothing. And then I travel back to New York, and I come back to my wife, and I say to her, listen, I'm going to go to France, find diamonds, and we're going to be very rich. She looks at me and says, wow, you should have stayed in the police. By now, you'd be a meter maid. <laughs> but <clears throat> I do not get deterred. I get on a plane, land in France, rent a car, start driving along the Rhine River. Suddenly... I see the farmhouse, I see the church, and I realize that's the hill. By the way, I expected that on the hill there'll be a big neon sign saying the diamonds are here. <laughs> that didn't happen. I climb up the hill, I'm all excited, I've got my shovel. As I get up the hill, I nearly start crying because on the hill there's not only one foxhole, you realize. All along the ridge there are about millions of foxholes, not millions, but many foxholes. And from every one of them you can see the farmhouse and the church, you remember, so... But I'm not deterred, and I'm a can-do kind of a guy, and I start cleaning the first foxhole, I think, where the, where the diamonds are. I find nothing. I dig the next one. Every time I dug, I believed I'm going to find them. I didn't just dig for the sake of digging. I dig the whole day, go down to the local hotel. I sleep. The next day, I'm all excited. I get up the hill. I dig more foxes, find nothing. Third day, I find nothing. When I get up the hill on the fourth day, suddenly out of the wood, comes the gendarme, the local guard, guardian of the woods. He's very angry. He's got a, a pistol on his hip and looks at me and says, what are you doing here? You should not be doing it. This is a military area. Do you have a permit? What are you doing here? And I'm very surprised. I don't know how to answer him. But what I do is I decide to tell him, listen, I'm, I'm on this hill, and what I'm planning to do is I'm going to make a documentary about the American army during World War II in this area. And suddenly he gets all excited and he says, great, fantastic. You know what? They made movies and tell stories and history books about what happened in the city of Strasbourg and what happened in the city of Metz. And there were many wars. Our area didn't have lots of fighting, so no one remembers it. You're going to make a movie about the area? Fantastic. People will hear our story and it will help tourism. It will be great. And, you know, I just lied, and I don't exactly know what to do. And he says to me, listen, <clears throat> there is a local historian who's specializing in World War II history and what happened in our region. And if you'll talk to him, I'm sure it'll be good. And I said to myself, I should meet this historian because what's going to happen is instead of running around and looking at various holes, he'll tell me what happened on the day that Sam got wounded and where the battles actually took place. The next day... I cross the Rhine River from France into Germany, and for the first time in my life, I touch German soil. I meet the local historian whose name is Herr Müller. Herr Müller is in his late 60s. He's wearing the local clothing. He's very happy to see me. He doesn't even ask my name. As you know, someone li li living in a small area, studying local history, no one really cares about it. Suddenly, someone from the outside comes and wants to hear the history, and he's very eager to talk about it. Doesn't he ask who I am, what I'm doing. He just wants to give out information about the war. So I sit in front of him about one meter away, and he begins talking and telling me about the war and telling me about what happened on that date. Unfortunately, there were two problems. The first problem was that, Herr by the way, I speak fluent German. But on this mission, which I'm going to tell you about, I never once spoke German. I don't know why. I constantly spoke English. The guy is speaking in English. Unfortunately, his accent was very heavy to understand. I don't know if any of you spoke to Germans, but somehow their English is stilted. It's very difficult. 
so I didn't really understand a lot of what he said. The other problem that Herr Muller had was he spoke very slowly. And you know when someone speaks very slowly to you, you, you fall asleep. He keeps on talking. I'm, I'm closing my eyes. And it's boring as all hell. Suddenly, he leans forward. He touches my knee and says, you know, I was in the best army in the world. And me waking up, uh, I say, yeah, me too, of course. I was talking about the Israeli army. He was talking about the German army. And then he says, I saw a lot of action in my life. And being an idiot that I am, I say, yeah, me too. Then he crosses his hands on his chest and says, when I was young, I belonged to the Waffen-SS. For those of you who do not know, the Waffen-SS were the Nazi units that murdered the Jews. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the person who killed my people. These are the guys who killed six million Jews. What do I do? Do I jump at the guy? Do I choke him? Do I beat him up? Do I murder him? Couldn't figure out what to do, and the guy kept on talking. Suddenly he says to me, you know, you're a good listener. Why don't you meet my nephew? And I said, why? Why would I meet your nephew? He says, oh, he's good. He'll talk to you about the war. And I've got no idea what I, why I did what I did. It, it just happened. <clears throat> I said, okay, I'll meet your nephew. The next day I travel to the city of Frankfurt, and I meet Herr Muller's nephew. Herr Muller's nephew is called Charlie. Charlie is tall, is in his mid-twenties. He wears black clothing with a golf shirt, and underneath the shirt I can see a tattoo with an SS on it. For those of you who do not know, the SS are those bad guys. I don't exactly know why I'm there, but Charlie is all excited to meet someone from the outside. He never asks my name, never asks who I am. I, I, I imagine his uncle called and said, listen, talk to this guy. He's talking about World War II. And we sit down, and Charlie tries to practice his English, so we're talking in English. And as we're talking, suddenly Charlie says to me, tell me, do you know who I am? And I said, no, I don't know who you are. And he says, I am the leader of the neo-Nazi skinheads in Frankfurt saying, oh, my God, a Jew son of Holocaust survivor is sitting with a leader of the neo-Nazis. And as we continue talking, I say, there's not much to happen. It's going to happen here. And I say, bye, I'm, I'm going, I'm leaving. And just as I turn around, he says, you like movies? Boom, there was something to talk about. At the time, I was doing <coughs> my master's degree in film studies. And my thesis was built on learning about the, the films made between the two world wars, the, the German films. By the way, a great industry, and even today, many of their films are very good. <clears throat> I specialized in the work of a woman called Leni Reffenstahl, who was a personal friend of Hitler and made some of the movies that all of you have seen. When you see the movies about the marches in Nuremberg with all the Nazis, etc., she she made these movies. And I show that I know a lot about it, and I know a lot about information, and I think that Charlie, in his naive way, thought to himself that maybe I'm a Nazi like him, because at a certain point he says to me, you know, I am the president of the movie of the month club. I said, what? He said, yeah, once a month we get together and we watch a movie. Would you like to be my guest? I don't know why. I can't tell you why I said yes, but the next day, he travels in his car, I travel in my rented car, and we're driving <coughs> through Frankfurt. We're getting to smaller and smaller roads. I look at the watch, and it's about half an hour. I'm saying to myself, they're traveling half an hour to watch once movie, uh, one movie once a month. It's, it's a bit uncomfortable. After another 20 minutes, which is nearly an hour, I'm feeling very uncomfortable, and, and I can't say I'm afraid, but I'm getting very anxious. Then I'm saying to myself, that's it. If in the next 10 minutes we don't get to where we're going, I'm leaving. This, this is a bit dangerous. And as I think it, Charlie moves to his right and enters the forest. <coughs> and I drive behind him. And we arrive at a big building, a huge building, which is a hotel probably built 200 years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Charlie parks his car in front of the hotel runs in. I look around for a parking spot in the parking lot, and there are about 70 cars there, and I'm saying, wow, a small hotel in the woods with many, many guests. I park my car, and I walk into this building. 
As soon as I walk into the building, I nearly fall backwards fainting because the room is full of men wearing Nazi uniforms. Not T-shirts, but actual Nazi uniforms. And the place reeks. It smells terrible. It smells of vomit and food and cigars and cigarettes and urine. It smells terrible. It feels uncomfortable. But as I'm standing there, I'm thinking to myself, I I've been here before. Obviously, I haven't been there. And I'm saying, I know this place. Suddenly, it occurs to me. The place was built to be an exact replica of Hitler's beer hall in Munich. You know that Hitler had this beer hall, and that's where he rose to fame. And I feel, this is an exact replica. But as I stand there on the steps, uh, many of these men look at me. Who is this guy? And uh, Charlie points at me and says, Komeraden. Komeraden means comrade. Comrade is a man who is not your friend, but agrees with your way of life. And then he points to a chair and says, well, sit down. He says to me, and I sit down on a chair, and Charlie does very strange things. The first thing he does, he walks around the room and gets the payment, the dues, from people who watch this movie once a month. And the people pay him $1,000. And I'm saying to myself, $1,000 to watch a movie once a month? This is crazy. And within... Five or ten minutes, he was holding in his hand a pack of nearly $70,000, which is incredible. Puts it in his bag and pulls out of his bag a box of Kleenex, of tissue paper. And he takes some of the tissue paper and gives it to the first guy. The first guy takes paper, and they move. the box moves around. Then the lights are dimmed, and on the screen, the movie begins. On the screen, five men are torturing and beating and raping a seven-year-old girl. As this is happening on the screen, the men in the room are sitting there making jokes, throwing stuff at the screen, making suggestions as the film is moving and these men are hurting the girl. Eventually, when the last guy hurt the girl, he bends down, picks her off the ground by the hair, with the legs dangling in the air, he looks at her and starts smiling. From the right of the room, one of the men starts running. As he's running, he puts his hand in his back pocket. And as he's running, he pulls out of his pocket the knife. He runs towards the girl, sticks the knife in her throat, and cuts her open. As she falls to the ground, dying, the men in the room all stand up and start screaming, Sieg! Heil! Sieg! Heil! For a period of time, I lost consciousness. When I woke up, there was no one in the room except Charlie was talking to me. I don't know what he said. Two days later, I arrived home. I can't tell you how I got home. Didn't speak to my wife, didn't touch my children, just entered my bedroom, closed the door, and for the next 11 days, I stayed in the room, never left it. I was as bad as can be. I was in a depression. I didn't know what to do. After 11 days, I figured out what I need to do. I left the room, took the sheets, I burnt them, and I said to my wife, I'm going to make my way to the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles. Simon Wiesenthal is a famous guy, very famous. He is a Jew who survived five different camps during the war. And if you understand, the man lived through five camps, which is incredible because in these camps they used to kill people almost on a daily basis. He survived. And at the end of the war where the Jews were leaving Europe to America or to Melbourne, Australia, or to Palestine, uh, which is Israel, he stayed in Germany and he said, I'm going to do one thing for the rest of my life. I will do one thing and nothing else. I am going to hunt down all the Nazi criminals who escaped the Allies. I will hunt them down and bring them to justice. And he did just that. It became a one-man operation. Eventually, people joined him. And they started bringing out the various German criminals who hid amongst the population, who changed their identities, and so forth. When he got older, a group of men decided to keep his way and continue his good works. And they made 
They built three Wiesenthal centers, one in New York, one in Jerusalem, and one in Los Angeles. I made my way to the largest Wiesenthal center, which is also a study center and information center. I knocked on the door. The door was open. The place is very large with about 100 people working there as, as uh, investigators and, and as research people. I opened the door and I met the guy who runs the place, a guy called Marvin Heyer. And he says to me, yes. And I said to, me, to him, my name is Yaron Svora. And he said, what can I do for you? And I said, I'd like you to help me to infiltrate the new Nazis in Germany. <laughs> he looked at me and says, listen, the nut house is two buildings from here. And he said, uh, listen, what do you mean infiltrate the neo-Nazis? And I said, I've got to tell you something. And we gathered together, me and Marvin Heyer and the leaders of the Wiesenthal Center, and we're sitting there, and I told them my story. The thing is that I told them everything. You, I just told a very small bit. It was much worse than that. After two hours, when we all walked out and we were wiping our tears, the people in the Wiesenthal Center said, what do you want to do? And I said, look, I've got to go back to Germany, and I've got to travel around Germany and see that the thing that I saw in Frankfurt is not one-off, but this is happening all over Germany. Nazis involved in snuff movies and killing girls. I've got to see for my own eyes if this is true. And if so, why doesn't the German government do something about it? And they said, well, how do you want to travel? I said, look, I, I don't know. Of course, as Yaron Svore, the Israeli son of Holocaust survivor, it's not going to work. So we decided on, on an entire James Bond spy operation. And a guy from the FBI came and a guy from CIA came. And we started doing various James Bond activities. After nearly a week, I said, listen, it's not going to work. I, I won't be able to do this complicated spy stuff because I'm not going to be able to do it. However... I've had an idea. Instead of, doing a, of, instead of doing this undercover, I'm going to do it on its surface. I'm going to arrive in Germany, meet the neo-Nazi skinheads, and say to them, listen, I am a journalist. I work for a far right-wing neo-Nazi magazine back in America. And I want to tell your story. And I knew one thing, that people love to talk about themselves. And I also was going to tell them, listen, the world hates you. They think you're animals. They, you're murderers. You are scum. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to tell your story in a big magazine back in America. And I figured this is going to work. I invented a name for myself. I became Ron Fury. And, of course, I had to speak to these guys. And, I, again, I decided I'm never going to speak German because I wanted them to speak next to me in German, figuring they don't know I'm speaking German and I'll be able to gather information. Unfortunately, although this magazine is supposed to be an American magazine, I don't speak American, and I decided I'll be an Australian journalist. I could bastardize my English to Australian, uh, saying, g'day, mate, and stuff like that. And before I leave, we set up a red phone in the Wiesenthal Center, which, as I said, is a big research center. The phone is a red phone in the corner, and next to it should sit a secretary 24 hours a day. Every eight hours, they change. She has to sit there and basically do nothing, just wait for the phone to ring. The phone is supposed to be the phone, which is the secretary of the Right Way magazine. So she could sit there. She had a piece of paper next to her answering all the questions, who we are, how long we've been in print how many people are involved in it, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, she will say that the journalist Ron Fury is traveling around Europe interviewing the neo-Nazis. <laughs> the red phone was put there alone, and I figured this is my lifeline. And as I traveled to Germany to meet the skinheads, one day the phone kills me because it works in the wrong time. And like in every bad Hollywood movie, I'll tell you about it. I travel to Germany and I begin meeting the skinheads. <laughs> you can ask me, what do you mean meet the skinheads? All of you can meet them. They're all at the same place always. If it's Belgium or France or Italy or Germany, all the skinheads will always be in the same place in every city. They will be next to the train station, the central train station. Why? Because usually the train stations are in a more decrepit area of town and you know it's not, it's not the good area. It's an area where with... with small restaurants and small hotels and electronic shops and, and brothels. It's not, a, it's not a nice area. 
And I decide I'll make my way to the skinheads in Berlin, and I'll introduce myself, and we'll see what happens. So I arrive at the central bus station, and indeed, I meet a group of skinheads. Hi, my name is Ron Fury. I work for an American far-right neo-Nazi magazine, and I want to hear what you have to tell me about yourselves, because you're misunderstood. And they love it. Someone is interested in us. Someone wants to tell our story from America, and they start talking to me. They befriend me. One guy takes me to live in his home for two days, and I stay in his basement, and he's got this big shrine to Hitler. And after a while, he says to me, why don't you meet my friend in Hamburg? And I travel to meet the neo-Nazis in Hamburg, and I travel within the neo-Nazi movement. After two weeks, I decide to call my handlers at the Wiesenthal Center. At that time, all of this happens in the beginning of 2000. At that time, there were no smartphones and no mobile phones, so I call the people in the Wiesenthal Center, but I call them in what is called the cutoff. I don't call directly. I call the phone to England. They call France, and from France to Belgium, and then the call goes to the Wiesenthal Center. And what I say to the people at the center, I say, listen, the neo-Nazis are not the problem. They are the tip of the iceberg because they can be seen for what they are. The true problems are the Nazis who are still in hiding. And they are like you and me. They are teachers and professors and border guards and policemen. And they are the problem. And I want to see how big and how endemic the Nazi problem is in Germany. But listen, it's not going to work. This nonsense about me being a journalist and talking to these guys, these guys won't talk to me because they're undercover. However, I've got an idea. I'm going to travel within the Nazi movement and tell them the following story. Yes, I work for the Right Way magazine. Yes, we want to hear about you, but I've got another reason. We in America, the guys who run this magazine are very rich. We in America want to help your movement in Germany. And the way we're going to help, we're going to give you money. However, we want you to flourish. We want you to grow. We want you to get better. And the reason we want this to happen is the better you'll be in Germany, the more powerful it will help us back in America. We will become more powerful. However, I want to travel and meet people and decide who I'm going to give this money to. By the way, I talked about huge sums of money, hundreds of thousands. I'm just going to give it to them. And I want to meet the various groups in the various towns, realizing that every group is autonomous because the group in Berlin hated the group in Munich and the group in Munich said the group in Hamburg is a bunch of idiots, etc., etc. So I travel within the Nazi movement. This mission that was supposed to be <coughs> one month ended up with me being a spy in the Nazi movement for 11 months, two weeks, and a day. As I'm traveling within the Nazi movement, I decide that I'm not going to give money to every... Uh, Tom, Dick, and Heinz. I'm going to travel within the movement and see what they have to say. Now, they wanted to impress me. Give us the money. We're close to the Third Reich. We're close to Hitler. So everyone came with various stories. And as I travel within the Nazi movement, constantly I hear the same name. The good guys, the good guys, the good guys. And whenever I ask my host, who are the good guys? No, no, we can't talk about it. We can't talk about them. Listen, these guys are practice, uh, practicing terrorism. They want to use weapons. Uh, we are more political. We don't want anything to do with them. Wow! A guy that are pract a guys who are practicing terrorism, I want to meet them. You know what? I want to give them money to buy weapons, etc. Great idea. No, 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 no. Eventually, after five months, the guy from Dresden says, I can arrange a meeting. And indeed, I travel to meet the terrorist organization, the good guys. I travel. It's, it's the mid of, uh, middle of winter. I travel to a lake and uh, forest, I park my car, and from the woods, my instructor, my, the guy who's going to show me what's happening, comes out of the woods. He's a tall guy wearing a military unif uh, camouflage uniform with a submachine gun hanging off his shoulder. He does not speak English. I do not speak German. And he takes me around to show me the camp of these terrorists. And he shows me the living quarters. And I said, what the hell am I doing here? He shows me the practice building. And I say, why have I wasted my time? And we move around. And he shows me the training ground. And I'm saying to myself, that's nonsense. 
After 20 minutes, I say, thanks, I'm leaving. And as I move towards my car, suddenly I hear sounds below a tiny little hill. And I look down, and there are 17 men there practicing at soldiering. They, they are firing their bullets, rolling on the ground, firing again. Their soldiering is pathetic. They're really bad soldiers. You see that they really don't know anything they're doing. So I turn to my guide, and I look down the hill, and I say, wow, they look like they're in Machanesh Monim. Machanesh Monim is a Hebrew word, which is Camp 80. And as I said, Machanesh Monim, I realized I spoke Hebrew in the middle of a Nazi camp. And the guy looks at me and says, Was? Which is what? Because the word Machanesh Monim doesn't sound like English. And I started feeling very uncomfortable. I just spoke Hebrew. Now, in spy school, they teach you that when you're undercover and you made a mistake, Keep on moving. Don't worry about the mistake. Keep on moving forward. I wasn't a good spy, and I didn't know anything about spy, spy craft. So I turned to the guy, and I want to make things okay. And I want to tell him in English, please, let's move on. I turn to him, and I say, Bevakasha, bonazuz, which is Hebrew. And the guy looks at me. I start shaking, literally shaking as though I'm, I'm a leaf. And I'm covered with sweat. And I said, I spoke Hebrew, I spoke Hebrew, I spoke Hebrew. He will understand something's wrong. <clears throat> and he's looking at me. He picks up the machine gun. He doesn't point it at me. He picks up the machine gun, turns it from, on, from off to on, and again says very quietly, Was? In Israel, when I have an argument with you, we, we start arguing, and then we, we literally come nearly to blows. Eventually, we walk each towards his other. I put my arm around you, and we walk and have a beer, and all is okay. I felt uncomfortable, so I walked towards this Nazi guy with the uniform who feels very uncomfortable with me. I put my hand on his shoulder, and I again want to say in English, please, let's move on. I put my hand on his shoulder, and I say in Hebrew, Bonelech. My hand is left in the air. The guy moves back. He doesn't say anything. He looks at me, and I realize that's it. I'm in a loop. I'm going to die now. I turn around. I try to walk towards my car, but I feel so stiff that I hardly can move. And I know that in any moment, I'm going to be shot in the back. I get to my car. I enter the car. I switch the car on, and I begin driving out of there a million miles an hour, and I can't hold the wheel, and only then I realize that I didn't breathe. So I take a deep breath. I look at the large mirror on my car, and suddenly I see that the guy is standing in the middle of the road. It's a dirt road, and he's thinking to himself, something is wrong. Something is wrong. He goes down on one knee, points the rifle, and starts shooting. This is a situation which is so incredible, so unbelievable. And it's like something that you see in movies. The guy is shooting at me. Now, there were two points in which I figured were in my favor. The one thing is what is, I was so scared that the car was veering from left to right. I could hardly drive. And it wasn't a good chance that he'd actually shoot me. The other thing, obviously, was he could never hit me because he never went to Machanesh Munim. I run down the hill, and I start driving on the road. And I say to myself, that's it. It's done. I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. Things were going so well. I was gathering so much information, but I, I can't. I've got to escape because the guy will know who I am. And as I'm driving, I start thinking, wait a second, wait a second. What actually happened? What actually happened was that I spoke Hebrew in the middle of a camp. But it was more my behavior, my fright, that worried him because obviously he doesn't speak Hebrew. Wait a second. I, I don't have to go to the airport. I stopped at the gas station, called the guy from Dresden. As soon as he picks up the phone, I said, you guys are crazy. I was going to give you a lot of money, but I go to a camp and you shoot at me. You are nuts. I'm leaving back to New York. There'll be no money given. And the guy tries to, to settle me. He says, no, 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 don't worry about it. Don't worry. I said, no, I'm leaving. The next day, they threw the guy out of the Nazi movement. How did I get information about the Nazis? Well, I used the system that was used by the FBI in the 1920s. If you know, there was a very famous gangster called Al Capone. Al Capone was a very tough gangster, killing lots of people, but he never got his hands dirty. And as much as they tried to catch him, they could never catch him. Eventually, 
they decided to use a system which is called the RICO system. Does anyone know how they eventually caught Al Capone? Can anyone tell me? Al Capone was eventually captured because of taxes. They came to him and they said, listen, there's a lot of money around here. You've got a castle, you've got a lake, you've got this and that, and all you have to do is two flower shops. How did you get the money? And eventually they caught him and they put him in jail and they used the system which is even used today, which is follow the money. Whenever there's a bad organization, you follow the money. Where did these guys get the money? They usually don't pay their taxes. They usually do a thing called laundering the money. If you don't know what laundering money is, that you use money out of a crime and you bring it to a business, which is a, leg a legitimate business, and you give the money to the legitimate business and the legitimate business uses the money and turns it over and the money gets cleaned. And I used the same system with the Nazis. What I did is whenever I arrived in a town with a bunch of Nazis and they met me and they were very anxious to show me how close they are, Hitler, uh, they are to Hitler and how come other organizations are not very good, I used to say to them, listen, mm, I really want to give you a lot of money. I want to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars, but can I put it in your bank account? No, 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 you can't, you can't. But I'll tell you what, why don't you put it in the account in the flower shop that my friend has and he'll use the money and get laundered. So I began gathering information about their various methods of laundering money and they all wanted to show me how tough they are and they told me various stories and gave lots of information. At that time as an emissary of the very rich <coughs> people who run the Right Way magazine, I, sta I got money from the Wiesenwald Center. I started wearing very nice clothing, no plaid shirts from Wisconsin just suits, uh, Armani suits, and I wore expensive watches, and I, I acted like a rich guy whenever I arrived in town. I used to take the local Nazi and his family to the best restaurant in the area, and I fed them, and I gave them the best bottles of wine. I don't drink, but they drank, and they were very happy. They actually believed me that I'm a rich guy talking on behalf of some rich people back in America. <coughs> and. At the end of the meal, I did one thing every day. It doesn't matter how much a meal cost. I used to put my hand in my pocket, pull out $500, and gave it as a tip to the waiter. And I put the money on the table. And they said, wow, he's really got money. The guy's for real. Then I used to go to sleep in the most expensive hotel in town. Usually, I, I always uh, ordered the top floor, the top most expensive suite. And I used to invite them there at, at night. I always traveled down the service elevator to my other car that I rented, which was waiting in the back of the hotel. I got in the car and drove to sleep elsewhere. I drove to sm small motels or to local brothels that I went to sleep there. And the next day I came back to my hotel because I was fearful that at night they might come and murder me. As I traveled within the Nazi movement, I figured that to pass on information, I have to find a way to send it to the Wiesenthal Center again. There's no mobile phones. What I did is whenever I entered the hotel, I came to the concierge, to the guy at the, at the desk, and I put down a chunk of money and said, that's for you, and I hope that you're my friend. And usually at the end of the day when I wrote my report, I'd come down to the guy, give him my report, sealed in an envelope. I said, go please to the mail office and send it. So I, I, I sent my information. As I'm traveling within the Nazi movement, both, how are we doing for time? We good? Okay. As I'm traveling within the Nazi movement, they begin explaining to me how close they are to the Third Reich. One day I meet a guy called Herbert Kulze. Herbert Kulze is in his mid-80s, a rather interesting guy. Herbert Kulze finished, in the 20th century, finished a school of butlers. A butler is a, is a guy who takes care of you. He finished it as top of his class. When he finished the school of butlers, a bunch of men came to him and said, look, we'd like you to work for an important person. And Her Herbert Kurze became Adolf Hitler's personal butler. Now, <clears throat> he wasn't a criminal, he wasn't a general, he had nothing to do with the Holocaust. But I sat with him for five hours and it was fascinating. He told me about Hitler. I, I, and we're talking about a guy who lived with Satan. And he told me about Hitler and he told me about his behavior and about his drinking special tea and about the relationship between Hitler and Eva Braun. And then when I left, as I said, I was traveling within the Nazi movement. I got a bit tired 
And one day they said to me, listen, <coughs> why don't you call a woman called Gudrun Borovic? She lives in Munich, and she would be very interesting for you to meet. And they figured that if I meet this woman, I will be much more inclined to give the guys in Munich lots of money. So I knock on the door. The door opens, and a woman in her mid-60s opens the door, has me sit down. By then, not one person was interested in my name and my occupation. Everyone wanted to talk. By the way, if you don't know it, in, in every criminal organization, no one really cares about your real name. It's, it's Big Joe, it's Sharp, uh, Tony, etc. Everyone's got a name. No one actually cares what your name is. She didn't care, like everyone else, and she has me into the house and sits in front of me, and the first thing she says, I can't understand, I can't understand, I cannot understand why the history books don't say nice things about my puppy. My puppy was a great father. He traveled all over and he used to send us presents and he used to send us drawing and great letters. I don't understand why people say bad things about puppy. He was great. And she talks for 10 minutes and eventually she has to take a deep breath. <clears throat> and I ask her, um, excuse me, uh, what's your name? She looks at me and says, whoa, you don't know? And I said, no, I don't know. And she says, my name is Gudrun, Gudrun Borowitz. And I said, and, uh, and she says, well, before my marriage, my name was Gudrun, Gudrun Himmler. For those of you who do not know, Himmler is the man who organized the final solution for the Jews. And I'm sitting there, I don't know what to say. After 10 minutes, I leave the house and I walk towards my car. My car is parked on the other side of the road. On the road, there are four lanes leading to one way. There is grass in the middle and four lanes leading to the other way. And I'm in a total daze. And as I cross the road, I, I'm nearly hit by cars. I get to the grass in the middle of the road and I fall to the ground. I feel my heart would explode. It was the first time that I actually thought I'm getting a heart attack. And as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking to myself, a minute ago, I was touched by the greatest criminal in the world. I was touched by Hermann Goering because, sorry, not Hermann Goering, I, I was touched by Himmler. Because what happened was that as she said to me, my name is Gudrun, Gudrun Himmler, she touched my hand. And then I look at my car, and the car is parked under a yellow sign with black, black lettering. And the sign says, Dachau, the camp of Dachau, 19 kilometers away. Um, for those of you who do not know, Dachau was a concentration camp in Germany. And that's a place where they threw everyone. The Third Reich put their communists and Freemasons and lesbians and gays and Jews Everyone that the Third Reich deemed terrible, they went to Dachau. And people died like flies there. And I said, okay, I'm going to make my way to Dachau. And something will happen. I'll see the place and, and I'll, I, I, you, I will get my second wind because I'm really feeling as though this mission is, is killing me. I traveled to Dachau and in the camp I found nothing. It was nearly empty. There were just five buildings left there. It was a terrible place. And the thing is, I felt very uncomfortable because the Germans haven't done a good job to remember their past. I walk into Dachau and I see the back wall. The back wall is called the killing wall, but people did not get killed there. In Dachau, they had a thing in which you wore your prisoner's pajamas and you had three numbers on you. There was one number on the chest, one number on the back, and one number on the hat you had to wear. If a German officer were, were walked next to you and you didn't immediately take your hat off your head and stood like that, they'd write down your number. And in the evening, they'd call out the numbers. And the men were taken. Their hands were tied behind their backs. Their legs were tied to their hands. And almost like a cow, they were hung on hooks that were stuck to the wall. And they were hung there for a day or maybe two. Some were hung there for two and a half days as punishment for not taking off their hat. And the people didn't die. At that point, I decided whatever happens, I don't care. I'm going to find the secretive leaders of the neo-Nazi movement. 
And at that point, they started checking up who I was. One day, the red phone in the Wiesenthal Center, the phone that's supposed to be my lifeline, that's supposed to be the right way magazine, where a secretary is supposed to be there and the phone rings and she picks up the red phone and says, hello, the right way magazine, what can I do for you? On the one day the phone rings, the secretary is sick. The German Nazis called their friend in America to check up if this right magazine, the right way magazine is for real and if I'm a real journalist. And the phone is in the Wiesenthal Center. And what happens is when a secretary in the Wiesenthal Center calls, by the way, people want to get information about World War II. She picks up, you pick up the phone in the Wiesenthal, Terra, and in the Wiesenthal Center and you say the following sentence. Shalom, the Wiesenthal Center, what can we do for you? The phone rings, the red phone rings. One of the people there who is a brilliant research guy finishes the conversation, hears the phone ring, there's no one next to it. He brings up the phone to his ear, puts it next to his ear and starts saying, the V, but instead of saying the Wiesenthal Center, suddenly he realizes it's the red phone and he says, the V, the right way magazine, what can I do for you? On the other side of the line, there is a voice he recognizes. The voice is the voice of one of the most famous Nazis in America. This Nazi was called by the Nazis in Germany to find out about the right way magazine. And he recognizes the voice. The guy on the other side of the line is a famous Nazi called David Duke. And Aaron, who's doing research, realizes that the guy's name is David Duke. And he says, the Right Way magazine. And David Duke says, listen, I know everything about the right way neo-Nazis in America. Never heard about your magazine. And Aaron, being very bright, says, oh, yeah, we're a small magazine. We're growing. I'm sure that you'll hear about it soon. And then the Nazi, the American Nazi says, listen, I, I've never heard of this journal, journalist, uh, 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 Ron Fury. Uh, I've been interviewed by most journalists. Never heard about him. And Aaron says, well, <clears throat> You know, it's, it's, it's very important. He's traveling around Europe. I'm sure that when he comes back, he'll be happy to interview you. And Aaron wants to put down the phone, but the Nazi, the American Nazi says, listen, I want you to sell, send me a copy of your magazine by Monday. This is Friday night. And he puts down the phone. What happens that night is the members of the Wiesenthal Center, nearly 30 of them, sit down and begin writing a Nazi magazine called The Right Way. They write articles, they draw caricatures, they send articles that ostensibly I wrote. They put the magazine together on Sunday morning, they send it with FedEx to the address given by the American Nazi. He, of course, gets The Right Way magazine, he reads it and he realizes it's a real magazine. And he sends it to his Nazi friends in Germany, and they said, I'm for real. By the way, I don't know all of this. I'm in the bits of, the, of finding the leaders of the neo-Nazis. By the way, they say that a better Nazi magazine has never been written. <laughs> At that point, I realize that I'm getting too tired and making too many mistakes. I call my friend Jim Murphy from 60 Minutes. And I say to him, Jim, listen, I've got a great story for you. Israeli, son of Holocaust survivors, Jew, infiltrates the neo-Nazis in Germany. He says, wow, what a great story. I, I'd like to, to know about it. I'd like to film it. I said, Jim, there's only one caveat. Everything that you film, film I want to get a copy of it. I want to bring it and do justice with it, bring it to, to the authorities. He says, no, 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 no. We're 60 minutes. We never gave our material away. I said, you've got it exactly an hour. If you don't get back to me within an hour, Good. I'm going to go with the story to Time magazine or the New York Times or one of the other uh, networks. Within 20 minutes, he gets back to me and says, fine, you can do your stuff. We will film it and we'll give you a copy of the film. And indeed, after a couple of days, a team from 60 Minutes, a large team, two, two cameramen and recording guys arrive and they take my jacket, they cut my, one of my buttons, they put a mic into it. And I start traveling within the Nazi movement, talking to them about money and other crimes. They film me from rooftops and from hotel buildings. They, they film undercover. And eventually I say to my Nazi friends, listen, 
next Sunday I'm holding a brunch and I want you all to come because I want to talk to you about divvying up, divvying up the money. And I rent a room at the Kampinski Hotel in Germany and the room is very large and I rent the entire room and 60 Minutes puts the cameras in hidden places, the microphones, and the, on Sunday brunch, the Nazis from various cities arrive, and all the leaders want to impress me. And how do you impress me? By coming with as many bodyguards as you can, because the more bodyguards you have, the more powerful you seem. So they all arrive, and we're talking about bodyguards. All of them are huge guys doing steroids. I'm talking about real mountains. For the first time in my life, I felt skinny. And they, we sit around the table. There are 13 of us sitting about around this uh, round table. And we're eating, and the cameras are working, and the bodyguards are standing behind us, very tough. And across the table, there's a guy sitting there making me feel very uncomfortable. His eyes are, are burning into my mind. And I turn to Heinz, my Nazi friend, and I say to Heinz, uh, who's this guy? And he says, oh, by the guy, the guy is tiny really small, almost like Yoda, and, and he's, in his, he's about 85, and his eyes are killing me. And I said, what's his name? And Heinz says to me, well, his name is Kampfan. Kampfan means the fighting rooster. And I said, how did he get the name? And he says, well, in the war, he, he was in the big war, and he got his name. And I said to Heinz, Heinz, what did he do in the war? And Heinz says, well, in the war, he was in the Gestapo. The Gestapo are the Nazi people. You've all seen the movies. The, the Nazis who come to Jews' homes and take them out of the home. And I'm saying to him, what did he do in the Gestapo? And Heinz says he had a very important job. He was a specialist. He was always able to find the Jews who hung amongst the non-Jews, who were hiding in, amongst the non-Jews during the war in Vienna and Paris. And I said to myself, don't look, don't look. He's going to see you. He's going to catch you. And I'm holding my head down and I'm trying to eat, but I can't. After two minutes, I look up and the guy is gone. And I say, thank God, thank God. And I'm beginning to eat. Suddenly, to my right, stands this little guy holding a gun in his hand, not with two hands, but with one hand. And the hand is shaking. And it touches my forehead twice. And he screams, you then, you then, you then, which means a Jew, a Jew, a Jew. And I freeze, and everyone around the table looks at the guy, and he's screaming. He's a Jew, he's a Jew, he's a Jew. Suddenly, one of the bodyguards, one of these giants, sees a guy with a gun. He doesn't know about Juden or Shmuden or any of that. He looks at the guy with a gun. He bends down and goes, whack! Hits the guy on the forehead. This little guy flies backwards, tries to touch the wall to stop himself. You hear his hand break. Literally, you hear knock, the hand breaks. The guy falls to the ground. He doesn't know anything. He just keeps on screaming. He's a Jew. He's a Jew. He's a Jew. <laughs> By then, I was able to get up, and I thought everyone's going to look at me, and I'll say I'm going to the bathroom. No one looked at me. Everyone looked over the table, and they saw this little guy lying around. All these animals, the supposed bodyguards, jumped on that guy and began beating him up because if one guy hits him, he must be bad. And the last thing I saw as I traveled out of the door is this guy beaten up. I don't know if they killed him. And I get in the car. I get in 60 minutes. I travel to America. It's a Wednesday. We begin organizing the special report by, by 60 minutes. Yaron, son of Holocaust survivors, Jew in the Nazis. And on Sunday at 8 o'clock on prime time, the thing appears. Story of Yaron Svore. 60 minutes shows it. Nothing happens in Germany. No one gets arrested. No one is put to trial. I start traveling in America, and I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is terrible. Nothing happened. And I do a huge interview on, in, on, in the Hilton on 6th Avenue and 53rd Street. Everyone is there. Time, Newsweek, New York Time, European magazines. Uh, other, uh, I do this press conference. These are the Nazis. This is what they do. These are the guys they murdered. I give the information, everyone writes major articles, even front page articles. Nothing happens in Germany. No one gets killed. No one goes to prison. I travel back home and I can't forget the girl. I can't forget the girl. I don't know what to do. Then I sit down and write a book. The book is called In Hitler's Shadow. In it, I tell my story. I write it in six weeks. I, everything comes pouring out of me. 
I travel to America and I sell the book to a very reputable book guys. It's called Simon & Schuster. I imagine many of you heard about it. The book becomes an instant bestseller and it's translated into 17 languages. Uh, Chinese, Japanese, Polish, German, Italian, French, well received in Hitler's shadow. It does really well. By then I've been about eight months after my infiltration. The book does, goes very well. And then what happens is one day people from HBO arrive on my doorstep and say, listen, we read your book and we'd love to turn this book into a movie. By the way, how are we for time? People have to leave or I've got another 10 or 15 minutes. So anyone who has to leave, please leave. Otherwise, I'll tell you the story. HBO comes to me and they say, listen, we'd like to turn your book into a movie. We'll pay you some money to buy the rights. And I'm thinking, wow, this movie, a movie with a hero called, called Yaron Spore. I say, let me give, give me a few days. I'll think about it. The next day, the phone rings. Uh, of course, it's a, in, uh, what a coincidence. Uh, one day, I I'm, I'm get a, uh, a meeting with HBO. The next day, the phone rings. I pick up the phone, and on the other side of the line, there is a voice that I really recognize, but I don't remember who, what the name. And the guy says, hello. And I say, hello. And he says, is this Yaron? And I said, yes, it's Yaron. And I remember the voice. And the guy said, is this Yaron Svore? And I said, yes, that's my name. And he says, I would like very much to meet you. And I said, who are you? And the guy says, my name is Robert. And I said, what? And he says, my name is Robert, Robert De Niro. And I, I, I say, what, what is the one? He said, listen, one of my, my producers read your book, and I think it's a great book to make a movie about. Why don't you come to Santa Barbara, where I live, and, and we'll talk about your book. I'll send you first-class tickets. And I travel to Santa Barbara, and I meet Robert De Niro, and we spend five days together. Fantastic. We talk about the book. We talk about the character, et cetera, et cetera. Then I said to him, OK, if I give you the rights, how long will it take you to make the movie? He says, well, listen. I'm making currently a movie called Casino. And after that, I'm, I have to make another movie called Goodfellows. And that will take another year. Uh, I'll get you a movie in about two and a half years. I said, sorry, I can't do it. I can't do it because the girl is killing me. I go back to HBO and I said to them, listen, I'll give you the rights to the movie. However, how long will it take you to make it? And uh, people in HBO said, well, if you give us the rights, the movie will be ready to be screened within half a year. And I give them the rights to the movie, and they make a movie, and the hero of the movie, the guy called Yaron Svor in the movie is an, uh, an actor called Oliver Platt. And they come out with a movie, and then they tell me, we'll call the movie The Infiltrator. And I said, why? You've got a book which is a bestseller called In Hitler's Shadow. Why would you turn it into the infiltrator? And they said to me, listen, I'm oh, sorry to tell you that there are three movies called In Hitler's Shadow. One is a French movie, another one is an Italian movie, and there was a movie made in America, which was a documentary. So we don't want to go with In Hitler's Shadow, we'll go with The Infiltrator. And indeed, in good time, this movie is shown as a premiere in a premiere movie in New York, and it's a big deal, and, and uh, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani arrives, and they all watch the movie, and it's very exciting. The next day after the movie is screened, the German government decides to do something, and they come down on the Nazi movement in Germany. They arrest 27 of the leaders, and these guys are put to court, and many of them go to jail. Some go to prison for 21 years. Other ones go for 17 years. And I managed to finish my, my job. And at that time, the girl moved away from me. She disappeared. And there's one thing that I want to finish with. I read something written by a Protestant priest called Father Nimular. And he said the following. He said, when they came to take the communists, I closed my eyes. I'm not a communist. When they came to take the Catholics, I closed my ears because I'm not a Catholic. When they came to take the Jews, I turned around because I'm not a Jew. When they came to take me, there was silence because no one was left. And we, my friends, cannot be silent. We should never be silent. Otherwise, evil will 
triumph, uh, evil will triumph. Never be silent in the face of evil. Thank you very much. For those of you who want to leave, you can leave. I, I have another 10 minutes to tell you about the diamonds, but if you want to leave, it's okay. Chief, are we good? Can we do it? Okay. After the screen over the movie, people come to shake my hand. As I told you about Sam, I fin the movie finishes, and a guy walks up to me and says, hi, and he gives me a business card, and on the business card there is a name, Phil Tuckett, president of the History Channel. And I'm very honored then. He says, listen, great story with the Nazis, but what's with the diamonds? <laughs> and I look at him and say, listen, my friend, there are no diamonds. I've been on this hill, and I have. With any time that I had time and money, I traveled with my friends. We looked at the hill. We tried to find foxholes. There are no diamonds. And I'll tell you the truth, Sam, this dog, this idiot ruined my life. He told me a story that is a lie, and he ruined my life, and, and I can't stand it. And Phil Tucker says, listen, you've got a beginning, you've got a middle, but you don't have an end. He said, well, listen, sometimes in life there are no ends. He says, what? I would like to film it. And I said, listen, the History Channel is great, but there's no ending to the story. He says, okay, let's go to the hill and film you and the team digging there, and that'll be the finale of the story. And who knows, maybe you'll find something. I said, we won't find anything, Sam is a liar. He says, okay, we'll go for one day, we'll dig there. And I said, you know what, good idea. We'll go for there for one day. At three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm gonna go to the French TV and to the German TV, and I'm gonna tell him, listen, World War II, American soldiers, 40 diamonds, farmhouse, church, let's see if you can find the diamonds. He said, great. We'll have a final scene. I'm going to rent a helicopter and see half of France running to the hill. <laughs> and indeed, a couple of days later, we traveled to the hill. I'm traveling there with, with a guy from the New York Times and with the History Channel people and with my friends. And I have by then, I'm number three on the list, on the hit list, on the murder list of the neo-Nazis. So I traveled there with bodyguards. And we get to the hill and everyone starts running around. Farm! Church house, they, they all get very excited. I've been on the hill many times, so I don't really care. And again, if you go into my site, you'll see this thing happening, and I'm standing there, and nothing happens. At 11 o'clock, Rick walks up to me and says, listen, how did Sam get wounded? And I said, ah, pff, listen, he must have been hit in, in the back by a piece of a bomb. And he says to me, can a bomb destroy a tree? And I said, yeah, obviously, if it falls next to a tree, the tree will fall. And he says, come over, come over. So we all rush over to the edge of the forest. And there's a huge tree there, big, very long, about eight meters long. And he says, look down there. And indeed, we look down there, and we see an outline of a foxhole. I, I've been on the hill many times, never saw it. And he says, let's remove the, the, well, the tree. And I said, listen, we're never going to be able to lift this tree. So we all stand around. Uh, History Channel is filming. We count one two, three, and the tree is lifted very easily. We realized that it fell many, many years ago and it's been eaten by, by, it's been eaten and that's why it's empty. And then there's the outline of the foxhole. So Rick jumps into the foxhole, starts cleaning it with his hands. Then he says to Mel Berger from the William Morris Agency, he says, listen, give me the small ax. And he takes a small ax, starts hitting the side of the foxhole he turns to me and he's holding in his hand a diamond. At that point, I, I nearly faint and I say to everyone, okay guys, let's go, our mission is finished. <coughs> and he says, wait a second. And another five minutes go by and he walks up to me, he's holding in his hand an upturned baseball cap and in the baseball cap, there are 40 diamonds. And I say, okay, let's go, this is great. And Phil Tucker turns to me and says, wait a second. I'd like you to do one thing. And I said to Phil Tuckett, what, what do you want from me? And he hands me over a phone. This is one of those satellite phones that you can call from everywhere in the world. He hands it over to me and says, listen, why don't you call Sam? I said, I don't want to talk to Sam. He says, you have to talk to him. So he gives me the phone. I put it to my ear. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Phone rings and the phone is picked up. On the other side of the line, there is Helen. 
And I say, hi, and she says, hi. And I said, hi, Helen. And she says, who is this? I said, Yaron. She says, Yaron, how did you know? And I say to her, know what? And she said, about Sam. And I said, what happened? And she said, yesterday, he got a massive heart attack. Now, out of all the things that I told you about, this is the strangest. And of course, this is the most unbelievable. How come he got a heart attack on the day that we were on the hill? It could have happened a month before, three months later. If you go into my site, you'll see that we took his uh, doctor's sheet when he goes into the hospital and our flight tickets because it's so incredible. And I say, listen, how is he doing? She said, he's not doing well. He's doing very badly. And I said, could I speak to him? She says, oh, I'm going to the hospital in one hour. This is the number of the phone next to his bed. Uh, try and call him. And I walk around the hill. I'm crazy. I want to finish this. An hour later, Phil Tuckett gives me the phone and says, call. And the phone has been he put in the number. I hold the phone. Doo -doo 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 -doo. The phone is picked up. And I say, hi. And a very low voice says, hi. I said, Sam. And he says, yes. And I said, Sam, this is your own. And he says, how are you doing? And I said, Sam, how are you doing? He says, I've had better years. And I said to Sam, Sam, are you sitting down? He says, no, I'm lying down. And I said to Sam, I've got some good news. And he says, I need good news. And I say to Sam, Sam, we found the diamonds. And there is silence on the line. He says, thank God, this was important. And the phone is grabbed from him. And on the line, there's Helen. And she says, what? What happened? And I said to Helen, Helen, we found the diamonds. And she says, don't forget, half of it belongs to me. <laughs> we traveled back to America. Rick took the diamonds to 47th Street in New York, which is the diamond district. He turned the diamonds into money. And what we did was we took the money, quite a lot of it, and we gave it anonymously to hospitals around the world, America, Kosovo, Rwanda, other places, we gave them money, and what we did, we gave the money to hospitals that deal with children who have cancer. And in every hospital, we gave 900 and, uh, sorry, 99,000.999, and we never gave 100,000. And the reason we never gave 100,000 was that if you give $100,000, you have to give your name and, and details. When you give less than that, you can get away with it. And we wanted the diamonds to be anonymous. And I believe that eventually, after all the suffering, etc., the diamonds did the good thing and the right thing. And I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. If um, uh, do we have time for questions and answers, or we're dead? Any questions? No questions, which is great. Okay. Thank you for coming.